May the 6th, 1898. The emerging working class is in revolt and demands better conditions, but is faced with an Italian government unable to handle the social crisis. Pirelli is closely involved with its workers. In the small building of the Seversetto factory, Giovanni Battista is restless. He observes the protests in disbelief. He's not worked 25 years for this. Giovanni Battista fought with Garibaldi in the battles of Bezzecca and Mantana. He lived through the Risorgimento to then pursue his vocation, studies and enterprise. He wanted to transform reality, improve his country through industry and help the less fortunate classes. After graduating 1870, his professor Giuseppe Colombo spurs him on to follow the path of natural rubber to satisfy his entrepreneurial curiosity, thus resulting in a virtuous example of a privately capitalized company supported by private individuals. In the spring of 1875, Pirelli wins an order from the Italian Royal Army for 1,600 rubber components for telegraph poles. A new challenge which thrills Giovanni Battista. For him, the future is in telecommunications. Pirelli acquires the cable-laying ship Cheetah de Milano, moored at the port of La Spezia, close to his second production plant. Pirelli submarine cables connect Puglia to the Tremiti Islands, Mazzara del Vallo to Pantelleria, the Agati Islands with the continent, and these with Sardinia, Livorno, Gorgona, and the Giglio Islands. Then it was Spain's turn, with connections between the Balearic Islands and the Iberian Peninsula, and even on to the Red Sea. But another revolution was coming, the transportation one. Rubber for carriage and bicycle wheels now accompanied the production of tubes, belts, sanitary products. With rubber, you can really make everything. The protesters move towards the center of town. Giovanni Battista observes the city lights which have illuminated Milan streets for 14 years, recalling that it all started at the Scala Theater, lit up by Giuseppe Colombo and his young student. The symbol of Milan closely entwined with the Pirelli name. It's the 17th of November, 1932. Alberto commemorates his father, Giovanni Battista Pirelli, founder of the great tire manufacturer, before the company's board of directors. I saw him bravely and tenaciously competing in the industrial arena, and I can honestly say that all the credit for our company's definitive success in Italy and abroad goes to the skill and shrewdness of the unforgettable man we have lost. As for his father, Alberto's 50th birthday is the occasion for drawing comparisons between his life and that of the company, a story full of memories. You will welcome the opportunity for a daring and broad mission, worthy of a young man wanting to go places. Bon voyage. While in New York, about to embark on a training trip, Alberto holds the letter his father sent him in 1904. In these lines, he recognizes the path the company will take in the future. Many things have changed since that journey along the rubber road, heading up the Amazon as far as Manaus. In Alberto's reports to his father, there is all his passion for the endeavor. The market is always incredibly strong. The arrivals are neither plentiful nor insufficient. Everything is purchased and dispatched. There is great demand from New York and Liverpool. The tyre soon becomes a strategic commodity. Pirelli is present in the leading European cities. It opens factories in Spain, England and Argentina. Its Italian soul is represented by the majestic structure of Bicocca. At the beginning of the 20th century, Pirelli faces the enormous challenge of producing pneumatica, as they were called then, that are reliable. The market associates the tyre industry exclusively with foreign brands, with names that seem to evoke the power of modernity. Now it's ready to welcome a new player, thanks to the decision to entrust its future to the power of imagination. So is born the myth of a brand supported by artists who, through their work, offer an image which is not yet futurist, but projected into the future. But also by industrial research, with successful products such as the Cord and Superflex, capable of flanking international competition. 
Perhaps it's not by chance that during these first 30 years of the 20th century, New York is pivotal in the Pirelli story. It was from here that Alberto set out on his journey in 1904. From one of its offices came the elongated P trademark that still accompanies the company today. Here again in 1929, unaware of the impending economic crisis, Pirelli is listed on the Wall Street Stock Exchange. From this panorama, it's impossible to imagine that Europe is heading towards its darkest hour. It is 1967, in the same place where Giovanni Battista had built the first Cevacetto factory. Two generations of heirs observe the city from on high. From that skyscraper, Pirelli looks towards the future. It was Alberto who wanted to commemorate the location of the first production plant with a monumental building that, at the same time, was as sober and elegant as the city of Milan, a work that, he already knew, would be embraced with pride by the Milanese. Leopoldo Pirelli is 43 years old. Since the sudden death of his uncle Piero, Alberto's brother, the manager has been playing an important executive role on the board, taking part in the development of various new products in the Cinturato line, which are changing the history of tyres. An expansion that, for Leopoldo, translates into technological innovation backed up by effective communication. Cinturato has got an entire society moving, and Pirelli embarks on a dialogue in which culture assumes a fundamental role. And so, after the Second World War, a monthly magazine dedicated to the culture of entrepreneurship is born. Its pages host prestigious names such as Giuseppe Ungaretti, Dino Buzzati, and Elio Vittorini. But Pirelli also wants to reach the public through a language that is more immediate, more pop. As a result, the Pirelli calendar arrives in the early 60s. Collections of images that have attracted the inspiration of some of the most influential photographers of all times, interpreting the changes in society through the exaltation of the female figure. An essential instrument to observe the evolution of custom and style. Thinking of the journey his family has made, Leopoldo views his beloved city through different eyes. He remembers a day, ten years earlier, when the building was still a bare construction site. For he and Alberto, that skyscraper represents the strength of a vision, of a boundless horizon. An entrepreneur must make every effort to always have his books in order. If he manages to do this, he must not consider himself a god, but one who has done his duty. This quote from Leopoldo Pirelli effectively expresses his understanding of company management. In the past, Pirelli expended great energy in growing through acquisition. In the early 90s, the attempt to merge with Continental, which follows the ill-fated ones with Firestone in the 80s and with Dunlop in the 70s, was not successful and heavily mortgaged the group's future. In 1992, Marco Tronchetti Provera takes the helm. He has another strategy in his mind, technology leadership as the basis of the company's new direction. As soon as he takes office, he sees a poster that says, we have to be an intelligent follower. He doesn't like this message in the least. He's convinced that to grow, Pirelli must follow the spirit of innovation that has always characterized it. This is how Pirelli experiences its turnaround. First of all, Tronchetti Pervera contacts the company's divisions spread throughout the globe and unites them into a single group strategy, reorganizing the management structure. 
Pirelli focuses its energies on the tyre sector, developing the P0 range and launching on the market forefront products like the P6000, leaders in the most important sporting events. Well aware of the quality and technological content of its product, the company doubles down on innovation, new processes development and sales drive. He takes the courageous decision to cede its diversified activities to focus on the core business. The cable sector is also modernised, substituting copper with new optics technologies. Communication, a fundamental part of Pirelli's DNA, is relaunched by interpreting modernity through successful endorsement and innovative campaigns. Brussels, February 1995. At the Al Gore organized G7, over 60 ministers and entrepreneurs are guests at a symposium dedicated to so-called information highways. And this is where the imminent technological revolution becomes evident. Marco Tronchetti Brevera is one of the Italian entrepreneurs invited. Many ask what a manufacturing entrepreneur is doing at a symposium tied to the future of telecommunication. Pirelli's pioneering spirit makes it a leading player in what promises to be a world in which technology is responding to new and ambitious challenges. The company, together with Milan Polytechnic, founds a consortium researching new photonics technology. Acquires the Siemens Cable and Energy Division, British Group BICC General and Cable Utilities Specialist NFK, becoming world leader in the sector. Opens into the Far East, undertaking major infrastructure projects. In the tyre sector, Pirelli continues its strategy, aimed at products with a high level of quality and technological content. This leads to the Flexi system aimed at the top of the range cars. The bike sector also witnesses a major development thanks to the launch of the P5000 Dragon. And above all, there is the birth of MIRS, an acronym for Modular Integrated Robotized System. Ready to integrate with CCM, continuous compound mixing, able to guarantee material control and extraordinary levels of precision. Pirelli is now ready to face the new millennium and its important challenges. At the beginning of the 21st century, Pirelli is a brand recognized in the world for premium tire production, taking part in sports competitions and a leading player in various economic sectors. Pirelli inaugurates the new millennium with the transfer to Cisco and Corning of the startups active in optical systems and components. The operation allows the company to gather enormous resources to seize new business opportunities paving the way in 2001 for a whole new industrial challenge. The world is rapidly changing. Technology and content are ready to journey in mobility and significant transformations in the new millennium inspire a project based on innovation. Thanks to the experience already gained in the cable sector, Pirelli wants to expand the borders of its work in telecommunication and becomes the key shareholder in Olivetti, which held the biggest stake in Telecom Italia. Pirelli wants to develop new revenue streams and markets for Telecom Italia through the integration of telephony and content that today are part of our life, an important goal not destined to be achieved. Indeed, in 2006, while the country celebrates the World Cup triumph, external interferences obstruct the project. Once again, the company returns to its key business, tyres. It focuses on the trait it has, sportsmanship always embraced. It continues its involvement in Superbike and over 400 motor championships, and after years of absence, returns to F1. Performance and safety point Pirelli's tyre range towards the prestige car sector. Results come in quickly. In a few years, the company doubles its profitability and its stock market value five times. With the tender offer launched by China's ChemChina, together with Italy's CamFin and Russia's long-term investments, Pirelli is delisted from the stock exchange in 2015. Then it splits the company's consumer and industrial activities. 
the group now reaches out to the consumer with technology, products, performance and safety, style and culture, with particular emphasis on services. Pirelli is thus ready to return to the stock exchange and to interpret the great changes in the market.